Well, good evening, everyone. And tonight, I have a real, really great pleasure in the show we're doing tonight. Like it's, uh, it's one of the real treats that you get sometimes in life to, to meet people who've been your hero and who you've uh, been really impressed by and admired in, in your life. And, and tonight is one of those nights. So if I'm beaming like a Cheshire cat, uh, that's why. I'll give the introduction, then we'll get straight into it. This gentleman... Uh, started his footballing career with Bradford Park Avenue until he signed for the Wolves, uh, 1968, I believe it was. He played for Wolves, Seattle Sounders, Coventry and Bristol Rovers. His career had 581 appearances and 98 goals. Scandalously, only one England under-21 cap, which is something I want to talk about because I cannot believe a player of this quality didn't get full honours, and that's a, I think that's a shame. Managerially, he managed Walsall, Cardiff and Hensford. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Wolves legend, absolute star, Kenny Hibbett. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi Kenny, and uh, as you probably gather from the interview, I'm really chuffed tonight. I'm, uh, this is this is a, an absolute pleasure to meet you, and thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, you're very welcome. Nice well, to you. meet you too. Um, we've gone through a little bit there in the introduction about about the career you had and and what a long career it was, and and, and how notable it was. I mean, I mentioned the other clubs there, but you know the the career you had with Wolves, which I think is you know it's going to be the main thing that perhaps we talk about tonight. <laughs> Extraordinarily long, a uh, goal-scoring midfielder, two League Cup final winning appearances, ups and downs with Wolves. Looking back on those days, and, and really, because I think many people like me will be fascinated, have you any particular sort of standout memory from that huge career that you had with the Wolves that really stick with you that to this day as being special moments? Yeah, well, there are oh. the, the several moments, Bill, oh. but uh, I think, the one that I'll always remember is uh, when we played Newcastle in 1974 at Molyneux. And my brother was playing for Newcastle at the time. And um, we beat them 4-2. And I scored all four goals, which is <laughs> only... It's, I've been told by my writer uh, that I was I was the only midfield player ever to play for Wolves who scored four goals in one game from a, yeah. midfield, from a midfield point of view. So, yeah, that, that was... That will not have sure. It's not in great nick, but it's um, but it was a it was a great time. And my my brother at the end of the game when he when the whistle went, he came up and gave me a few verbals. Um, <laughs> but, but then he said, "Look, if if we were going to get beat, I'm glad I'm glad you scored the goals, and I'll ne I'll never forget them words he said to me walking off the pitch at the end." Yeah. So that that was just one of you know, and the, obviously the League Cup final, which. When you're growing up as a youngster and a kid, you, I, I was, I was, a, I'm a big England fan, and um, I watched all the cup finals as well that was on television. And I went out and played before the game. Uh, half time, I was out with the ball. I was always Bobby Charlton. He was my favourite player. And at the yeah. end of the game, I'd be out there. So our dream was me and my brother's dream was always um, to play at Wembley in a, in a cup final. And uh, in 1974, we both actually played in the cup final. I played in the League Cup final and Terry played in the FA Cup final. Fortunately, I had the, the result that we, um, that we wanted. Terry got beat 3-0, I think, against Liverpool. And you scored in that. You scored in that final in seventy four as well as I remember. I, I did, yeah. It was uh, people keep asking me whether I miss it, and uh, I have to say yes, I did. But um, as the ball came across from across from Jeff Palmer. Um, John Richards came out towards the ball on the edge of the box to, and I went for the volley and he put his foot up and I lost, I lost just for a second I lost the sight of the ball with his leg up but I just carried on through and it's on top of my foot side of my foot and it just lobbed over Keith McRae who was in goal at Man City and I knew it was in because he, he was he was sort of one of them lob that, that, that he'd gone for the power shot and it was too late uh, I never saw it really in the back of the net I, I knew it was in the net you know and, uh, but yeah, that was a, that was um that was always our dream um, was to play a cup final and um, to walk up them stairs that or well, them steps that everybody else had done and particularly England in 1966 getting the World Cup. I was so proud of walking up them stairs to get my uh, my trophy and um, that'll always stick in my mind forever. It was it was a 
real fantastic day because my wife, my mum, my mum was in the stand, and unfortunately, when I was sixteen, I lost my dad, who was forty years of age. And his dream was to see me and Terry play at Wembley in Cup Finals and unfortunately he wasn't there to see it, but my mum was. And when I scored the first goal, I think it was about the 43rd minute, my name went up in lights and my mother just kept staring at it all through the sex. She said, I never saw the second half. I just was looking up at, uh -huh. in, this, in, in, in lights that, yeah. and she had tears in her eyes so she could hardly see the game anyway. But... It was just brought so many memories back when we, when me and Terry were growing up, and uh, unfortunately my dad wasn't there to see it, and and it really got to my mum that day. But yeah, she was very proud. Uh, even when Terry got beat three 0 she was still very proud of both of us uh, achieving something that we'd always dreamt about. Well, you you certainly did your your parents proud, um, not just on that day as well, but with your whole career. And and I, I want to give you a little insight as well because as a four year old boy walking around Bilston Market with my mom when my dad <laughs> and my uncle had gone to the match. I'm, I'm, one of my earliest memories, actually, is that everyone on the market stalls had the radio tuned in to listen to it. And yeah. when, when, when your goal went in, and this is one thing I've been dying to tell you, I can remember it to this day. When your goal went in, the whole of Bilston Market all jumped up in the air and everyone was shouting and, and singing around Bilston Market. And yeah. it's one of those things that stuck with me forever. Well, I didn't. I didn't realise that. That's a lovely story. Thank. I, 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 I guess I never. No, I mean I've got lots of people, lots of friends up in the Midlands, but never, never heard that story before. Not in Bilston. And, and sometimes when I go see my mate in the, in Wolverhampton, now we go, we go through Bilston. I think it's to get to Boundary Park, the Boundary Mill, is it? Boundary Mills, yeah, the shopping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, my yeah. mate always takes us up there because you get good stuff. And, and uh, but he, he, he never met. He's, I've never, it's the first time I've ever heard that story. That, that, that's lovely. That's right. Yeah, it, it was. It, it brought a massive smile to everyone's face. And, and also, I'm, having looked back on it on the TV since, you definitely meant that goal. There's no question in my mind. It was, it was on oh, purpose. I, I, Very I, clever, I, I, love. I meant it, of course. I went for it. But, but as I said, I, I just lost it for a, uh, just that second. And, and I, I have to admit it, I sliced it in. But it, it went in the net, and that's the main thing. That's it. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, that was the 2-1 the victory over Manchester City. And... And there was another League Cup final in your time as well, which which I think probably is one of the most underrated achievements by any side to beat that Nottingham Forest side in 1980. Yeah. And I, I was there at that one. The, 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 uh, my dad and my uncle actually dra managed to drag me along to that one. And uh, I remember the build-up for it. No one gave us a chance. No one well, gave us a hope. Well, what we have to forget is that they were the European champions as well. Yeah, and and there were there was a, a terrific side, uh, a very strong side all around the pitch. Um, but we never, we was never afraid. We, the confidence in the dressing room before the game was pretty high, and as long as we competed with them, uh, then we have a, we had a great chance because we we got goal scorers in our side, we got creativity in across the midfield, and we got great defenders. That's why we got to the final. So, yeah, on paper, it's like Man City in 1974. On paper, they were very, very strong. They, they had a lot of international players in their team. Uh, and the same with Nottingham Forest. Um, but, you know, my experience of both them finals um, was walking down the tunnel <coughs> when you get called down to, the, to walk down the tunnel onto the pitch was, was our fans to see the black and gold. It was just incredible. And I think that picked us up and I think they had a big part to play in our performances and our results in them two cup finals and so you know I, from my from me and all the lads we, we 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 said after the game that the fans played a massive part in both in both games so having had that experience in 74 we brought it and we took it with us in the 1980 cup final as well against Forest and that's how we approached the game exactly this um and it was like, I mean, we got a bit of luck. We got a bit of a break. Like my slice in the goal and Andy Gray scored the winner with a chest down when the keeper came out. She, and he, he, they were in two minds. And yeah. um, Andy keeps telling me he read it. He read it well. I said, you, you know, I'm, I don't believe that, Andy, mate. You know, but, but, <laughs> and, then I, and then when he was running into an empty goal, I was right behind, not close to him, but behind. Thinking, use your left foot, Andy, because how can happen if you try your right foot, you know? And he poked in with his left stick, and uh, and that's it. We tried to catch him because he went round. You know what Andy was like? Yeah. 
<laughs> celebrating in five side games when he scored. But yeah, it was a, it was a terrific terrific result for us. It really was. Um, and the fans, you know, the seniors win two massive. I mean, in them days, the league cup was pretty pretty good. It was it was very important to us. It, it's not. It doesn't seem a lot now uh, to to the present game uh, that we playing them winning the league cup. But in them days, it was it was vital. It us into Europe again. Yeah. Um, to play to play in Europe, Bill was unbelievable for for me anyway. Coming from Bradford, um, and then suddenly I'm playing it uh, in Turin against Juventus and Florence Vero. So I wanted all that again, like we did in '74. I wanted it again in 1980. We didn't have a great run in in '80, but in '71, '72 final, um, we got there through through our third position in the league. Uh, it was amazing to go all the way to the final. Well, that, that's something I want to talk to you about a bit more. But I think uh, one of uh, the friends of the show and someone who I, I know quite well will never forgive me if I don't mention the fact that, of course, we got to that 1980 League Cup final after an overhead kick by Melides, who yeah. he occasionally mentions it. You might be surprised to hear that he once or twice has mentioned that, uh, that goal against Swindon. And, yeah, always and, good. And, uh, and just another little insight as well. I was behind that goal and when the... Peter Daniel hit the ball long and Dave Needham chested it past Peter Shilton and Andy Gray ran onto that ball. I guess it must have only been a second, but I'll tell you something, Kenny, it felt like an hour to the fans behind the goals. We were watching and thinking, please put it in, please put it in. And when it went in, there was a, the biggest thing. Like, to, to this day, I don't think I've been in such a crowd surge and noise in my life. It was quite extraordinary. Oh, uh, yeah. so, another fantastic memory. But look, let's talk about these European exploits because... So many people don't remember the fact that Wolves were in one of the first all English European finals, weren't, weren't we? In the uh, UEFA Cup, as it was at the time, I believe. Yeah, yeah UEFA Cup. Yes, that's right. Tell, tell us a little bit about that cup run and about the final where we came up against Tottenham, who've been a, a bit of a jinx side for us in cup. cup, cup yeah, the, I, I, I'm down listening. I hate Tottenham. <laughs> Yeah. Good. Well, not, not, of... not not literally, but but like you said, they have been a bit of a, a pain in the neck for us. Um, FA Cup semi-finals, League Cup semi-finals, um, and the European Europe Europa Cup final, which was called in in them days the UEFA. But yeah, I, I, it was um it was a fantastic trip for us youngsters. Like playing all behind the Iron Curtain and 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 playing all over Europe was just an amazing experience for all of us. And the great John Charles, when we played Juventus uh, in Turin, he, he took us round the city uh, and, and he was a god over in there. He, we all went to buy these Italian shoes and we went in these shops and they're all bowing to him because he's just a massive, massive name in, 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 in Italy. But John Charles says to me, um, not just me, but the lads who were taking around the group, he said, you get a result tomorrow night. And two or three or four of them won't turn up in England, uh, which is exactly what happened. We got we got a good draw over there, and um, we came, we brought them back to Molyneux, and three or four of them didn't turn up. And uh, whether that helped us gain the result that we wanted, I don't know, but it, it, I think it helped us, uh, and we beat them. Uh, but there, there were there were trips all over the place, you know, it's places that I'd only. I'd only seen it in, like in geography lessons and stuff like that, you know. Um, but to play in these countries was fantastic. And, that, and I think that, I think it was into Milan, I think, uh, that Tottenham beat in the semi-final. And I think if, if they'd have got to the final, I think we'd have beat them. And I think we'd have won the cup. But Tottenham being a pain in the backside for us, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. But to lose the own leg didn't help. Uh, but we were the better side in the second leg. and, and um, I think when Nicholson, the manager, came into us at the end of the game and said, you're the best side lost, which yeah. was no consolation to us, but we were absolutely gutted. But going back to your original question, Bill, about the experience of it all was just unbelievable because there were so many of youngsters in there, you know, um, and it was something I'll always remember. And we got a nice little a little medal with the UEFA on, uh, which yeah. I've got in the cabinet there. But now I look at that, many times and have a feel of it um and i'm going back a long long time ago but they, they were the they were the highlights yeah definitely the um of my career in particular yeah yeah and, and, and of course for our, our tottenham supporting friends out there you uh 
You did have an element of revenge over them at a, a, a cup semi final at Hillsborough, as I seem to recall. <laughs> 81. <laughs> 81, 82, I know. I get that question thrown at me all the time as well. Well, I, did, that, did you miss it? Yes. Did you die? No. But the did you time... did you wink? Did you wink afterwards though? <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh. No, I didn't. Oh. People, well, I don't think I did. Um, I, when I got pulled, when Glenn Oddle went and tackled me, I fell over his back foot, and all our fans were right behind the goal. Yeah. And there was this mass. I'm lying on the. And I'm thinking that's a hell of a cheer for a corner. And John Richards came running up to me and he said, Ibi, Ibi, it's a penalty. Get up, you're taking it. Because I was a penalty taker, as you know, in them days. Yeah. And I said, you can get to it. I said, I'm not taking that. I was, I was, it was the last man, last kick of the game. It was the last minute. It was a heavy pitch. Um, I was felt so tired and my legs were like lead. But I'd always had an agreement with Willie Carr that if I never fancied taking a penalty, it, Willie would take it. So Willie took it and he, of course, he scored. It was the last kick of the game. If he hadn't have put it in, we'd have, you know, we'd have lost the match. But we should have won it in the extra time. We were fitter, stronger, more powerful. We had the chances um, and they were lucky to get away with it in the end. But then in the replay, uh, we had to go down to London. They had to go across London to Arsenal and play. Uh, and we got beat 3-0 and we got, we got battered. We, we never really played down there at all. So our, our, our chance was then in, in, that, in that match at Hillsborough. Uh, but I do get, I, I, when I do the Q&As, they always bring that up. But I say to these people, who scored the first goal? And they have to think about it. And they'll say, John Richards uh, or, or Wayne Clark. Or, I say, no, I did. I got the flipping first goal. But you don't talk about that. You talk about the penalty. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I mean, I, I mean Andy Gray had chested it down. I volleyed it in with my left stick. Um and, and nobody remembers it. <laughs> when you got up the night of the other last minute. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, that was another one I was there at as, as a youngster, and uh, I, I can't remember much about the whole thing because it was, it was, you know, on a serious note, as a, a member of the crowd at Hillsborough, even then it was packed. You know, it yeah. was horribly packed, and. Uh, yeah, not yeah. You know, I didn't I wasn't aware of much except for the fact that people were shielding me, trying to make sure that I was comfortable and safe. So yeah. I heard the noise from when the penalty was given and I heard the noise of the goal going in, but the rest of it was all a bit of a blur because it was it, it wasn't the most comfortable place to be a fan and, and obviously tragically a few years <laughs> later we, we, we saw more about that. That's right. Um, my my wife was at the game on that on, on the the semi final and she saw this oh, there was an overspill then days, you know, with, with fans going onto the terrace onto the uh, track. Um, and there was a problem in then days, you know. So, you know, it, it was uh, it was so sad to hear what, what had happened with the Liverpool game and, and all the fans there. And I think that when we played in that game in the semi final, we were very fortunate that nothing else happened at that time. Yes. But, um, as you as a young boy, uh, it must have been frightening as well, you know. Um, well, I'll be but, honest, Kenny, it was terrifying. It went, and uh, I, I've always to this day been grateful. There was some, you know, decent, big-sized black country lads around me who, who sort of formed a bit of protection. And uh, I was yeah. against, you know, against the crash barriers and were bracing themselves because it, was, it yeah. was bloody frightening. Right. Yeah, I'll bet it was. I can understand that, yeah. Yeah, it was um, not a great time. But, no. Um, yeah. You make yeah. me fight. When you talk about you being so small and young and all that, it makes me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think out of the two of us, I think you've aged better than me. That's oh, for sure. On. I don't think so. I've got yeah, no hair yeah. now, but it's all gone. Well, hang on. Let's not compete on hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we're on a level. Well, you're beating me on that. Um, no, I'm not sure. Well, you mentioned before about Bobby Charlton, and I'm, I'm glad you said that because... I was going to ask you a question, that, and I thought, well, is this going to sound silly? Is my memory a bit hazy in, in time? But to me, the way you used to play, you, I always thought you were sort of a, the Wolves version, if you like, of Bobby Charlton, of, of breaking out of midfield, of hitting long-range shots, a goal-scoring threat. W was that a conscious thing through your career that you were actually sort of modelling yourself on him? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I say, as a, as a kid growing up, uh, watching England play, particularly Bobby Charlton was my favourite player. 
Um, me and my brother Terry, we used to, uh, outside our house, uh, we, we built uh, two goalposts uh, about 18 yards apart. And we like shooting, shootings, we call it a shooting, where yeah. we were both goalkeepers as well, as well as shooting, but we, we practiced left foot, right foot, just like Bobby Charlton used to. And that was, um, I think his influence, had, had a great influence on my career in terms of wanting to shoot with both feet. And I, I practiced and we worked, me and, me and my brother practiced and worked in left foot, right foot shots. Um, I was two-footed because of Bobby Charlton, because I wanted to be like him, because he could cut out on his left foot and smack one in with his left foot, and he could cut in on on, on his right side and and, and still and, and, and was very well balanced when, when he hit that shot. So I tried to emulate that and try to work on that as, as a kid growing up. And, and um, so, yeah, and going back to that, what you were saying, that, that had a big influence on me running from midfield, trying to attack you, because I... I, I, I I could hit a ball with both feet, which I, which which held a great deal when you were cutting in from the right or cutting in from the left, which is what Bobby Charlton did. So yeah, and I was on a couple of shows with Bobby on Sky, and they asked me who my favourite player was growing up, and I, and I embarrassed him. He went <laughs> red as a beetle. Where I said, I said, Bobby, I have to. It was you, you know. And I didn't really want to say that, but the question came to me, and I had to answer it. And uh, but yeah, Bobby Charlton, and then. Playing against him on the same pitch was just crazy. I mean, I, as a kid growing up, watching him play for England uh, and Manchester United, and then the one the European Cup in 1968. Yeah. Um, it was just amazing. My first game at Old Trafford was in the reserves when I first joined Wolves in 1968 as a 17-year-old. And then to play on there in a reserve match was, was just because I'd been playing somewhere like Halifax and Rochdale and places like that, playing for Bradford Park Avenue. But to be playing on the same pitch as Bobby Charlton and Georgie Best and all them. Um, but then, further down the line, you end up playing on the same in, in, this, in a game. I never thought, I never thought that would ever happen to me. It was just an absolute dream, you know. I, I, so I was very fortunate to get that opportunity. I mean, you, 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 you're throwing out names of people you played against there that are sort of absolute legends, Bobby Charlton, George Best. Uh, and, and it's really, it's opening up, it's bringing me forward on some of my questions, actually, because it's always intriguing when someone's played through sort of a, a, such a halcyon era of, of great names. Obviously, Bobby Charlton was your boyhood hero, but actually out there on the pitch, was there a player, or a couple of players probably, who you came up against and you thought, bloody hell, this this guy is is something else. This is this is you know out out of uh, out of all recognition of other footballers. You know, did, did you have a moment of George Best or something like that, or or yeah, were that yeah. uh, at the time where you're just thinking, oh, this is just a competitor, and I'm going to you know we're battling this out. Well, like, that's a good question. That's a good question, Bill. But um, I mean, the best player I think I ever played against in terms of ability that was George Best. Yeah, and I asked I asked him once. You remember he played for Fulham. Yeah. With uh, with um, Rodney Marsh and Bobby Moore, and we played down at Fulham, and we beat them three one. And afterwards, we went in the players' lounge, and I was sat at the bar. And Georgie Best came and sat by me. And I only had half a lager, and I asked him, and yeah, anyway, we had half a lager, and I had half a lager with him, and it, that that was unbelievable. <laughs> so I asked him, I asked, I had to ask him, being a bit. Dozy, I said, tell me how you go past players so easily. And he mm. said, I don't know. I just I just do it. I don't even think about it. He said, I just do it. You know, and it was it was a nuts, it was a normal answer, I think, that there's somebody that there's some players that work on different things, but he said, No, I just I just do it, you know, and, and it was amazing. I mean, I was just I was up here actually when just just talking to him, you know, but he said no, no, I don't know. I do. I just, I just see it and I just do it. You know, it was just like pure, a, pure natural yeah, talent. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, it was. I mean, he was just an amazing player. He had great balance. I mean, the balance he had, the pace he had. Uh, he went past people. People tried to, like you know, all the fullbacks tried to hit him and knock him up. But they, he, he stood up strong. He was, he was a terrific player. Um, the skillful. Um, but I have to say, um, he was one of the best players I'd ever played against. 
Yeah. And, and on that, that similar vein, I mean, your Wolves career was so long and distinguished. You, you saw some of the legends of Wolves uh, played with you during your time there. Um, from you know, people we've mentioned already, John Richards and Andy yeah. Gray and Derek Dugan uh, and, and Willie Carr, you know, uh, so, some seriously huge names. Uh, amongst, you know, uh, without without embarrassing you, but, you know, of, of, of the teammates you've had, were there any moments or any, any sort of special, mm-hmm. special feelings that you had that thought, well, this guy was a pleasure to play alongside or this is someone I've won in the trenches with me? Well... I was asked not long ago to to uh, put my best team down that I played with, yeah, and yeah. I refused to do it because every player I play with at Wolves helped me, yeah, while I was on the field. So I, I everyone I played with all was all the same for me, all the same, all the same standard, all the same quality. Helped me perform and, and helped me score goals and um, you know helped my career along. So there, there is. There is no, there is no special uh, team or special players. They were all fantastic to me, and um, I, I mean, my best, one of my best mates there. I mean, John Richards came a year after I did when I was seventeen. He came eighteen. Is uh, is related to me now with his wife and my wife and cousins, and um, we in all the time we've known each other right up to now, we've never had a, a dispute or an argument over anything. We've we've yeah, always yeah. been quite supportive. Willie Kai is one of my. Uh, well, he, I shared a room with him for seven years when he when he joined us. So I, I got to know him very well. Him and his family, and uh, he's actually coming down with to see us in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time. So, um, but uh, you know, you got John McCall, who was very underrated player at Wolves. I thought it was a terrific yeah. player. Frank Munro was one of the most skillful players. We used to on the Saturday morning before a away game. We used to walk around get get some fresh air in our lungs, and he had a coin and he'd toss it up in the air, catch it on his forehead, drop it in his top pocket. <laughs> Alan Sunderland thought, "Well, I can do it." I tossed a coin up and it came down on its edge and, and cut his head. Uh, you know things like that, that. That was just terrific. We had a fantastic team spirit and a great camaraderie. And and last year, I think I saw Nuno, who's left us now, uh, but. Yeah. He, he said we have a great team spirit, and and that's what we had. And if you haven't got a great team spirit um, and camaraderie, then you ain't going to win much. And that that's what we had, you know, from Phil Parks, who's he always said Parks, Parking, Palmer, you know, he, he, Bailey, Munro, McCall. That was like your back five players, six players, uh, and then you had Jimmy McCallion, who was a fantastic player. Waggy was my favorite, one of my favorite players. I loved. Him. What, well, I love playing with him. Uh, very creative. Uh, John Richards, as I say, you know. So we, we, Willie Carr was, and Stevie Daly who came in later. Great midfield. Me, Stevie, and, and Willie. We we we, sc- we all scored double figures when we were in the second division at that time, and we got promotion. So yeah, a great. Um, I was very lucky. I was very lucky to be able to play with all these great players. Absolutely. Um, and John Richards, of course, I mean, the, the man who held the Wolves goal scoring record until Steve Bull, who is the yeah. only other person I, I can think of who played for Wolves who scored four goals against Newcastle, by the way. Apologies <laughs> to Newcastle fans who, who might be cheering in, but there's I, a link I, there. I, yeah, yeah, uh, that, was a, that was a for Newcastle, wasn't it? Yeah, that was on a New yeah. Year's Day. And um, yeah, I mean, right. John, John Richards' is sort of superstar status in, in, the, in the town at the time. I, here's another one to make you feel old um i was when when i was at school we won a rounders <laughs> competition and we had to go to the civic hall in wolverhampton for the awards and john richards was handing them out and i was so nervous i couldn't look him in the eye i was that petrified because he was you know i was only about eight or nine years old and i always remember to this day how kind he was to all of us kids lining up he was a real gentleman he was really you know he, he, he took yeah. time and, and he, he made sure that we experienced the moment it, not the way some footballers nowadays can be he, he really yeah, made an yeah, effort yeah. Uh, and yeah and here's another thing about john richards and you having something else in common and this is something that has baffled me for years and years and years john richards won senior england appearance where i believe he was shoved out on the wing on the right wing yeah yeah you won england under 21 cap two under of the 23 most- bill under 23s under 23, I apologise. <laughs> now, I, I cannot, for the life of me, understand 
how that can be possible. And I'm not saying this just from a Wolves perspective, but you're talking about a striker who was hitting 15s and 20s every season, a midfielder who was very much in the mould, as we've said, of Bobby Charlton, um, and who was consistent all the way through, and who would walk into the current England team, which we'll discuss later, in my opinion. And I won't ask you to comment on that, because obviously that's blowing your own trumpet. But I, I, I firmly believe that. At the time, did you, or, or since, did you ever feel bitter about that or, or disappointed? Um, no, I'm not bitter. Uh, I, I can say maybe I'm slightly disappointed. But look, it, it's, it would have... When I got my when I got the under when I got the under twenty three cap, I'd only played six first team games, and uh, Sir Alf Ramsey had picked me, and I was on the bench against uh, Wales um, at uh, Wrexham Ray or the race coast. Um, I had one shot on the, from the penalty spot that got kicked off the line, and we drew nil nil. But if that had gone in, maybe I'd have had another cap. I don't know, but no, it never it never concerned me that much. Yes, looking back, you think. I would listen. I, I would have loved to have played for England. I would. Uh, I've got me England under twenty three shirt upstairs, and I keep looking at it. And I feel it, and I touch the three lions and that. Of course, I would have loved more more caps. But my job, my job was to play for Wolves and perform week in week out if I couldn't stay in the side, and that was the most important thing for me. But to represent your country would, yeah, it, 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 I'd be lying if it didn't bother me. It, well, it didn't bother me. It, I would have loved to have been able to to play for England at the time. But you look at and you look at John, who was a prolific goal scorer, and then when he did get picked, he was on the wing. Um, but if you look at the players that there was around in them days, far, far bigger squad of players was available for the England manager for selection than there, than there, is, than there has been over the last five or ten years. That, that's how I feel. I was picked for the England B Tour, and mm -hmm. I... And I broke my ankle in the march against oh, Norwich City at Molyneux. And uh, I think I think Mel may have taken my place. Um, he didn't go on an England B tour. I'm not sure if it was that yeah, long. I think, I, think, I think they took Mel. Um, but that was my that was really my last opportunity. But I wasn't worried about it. I wasn't dejected or disappointed because I was still playing first team football for Wolves and, and that was my, that that's where my bread and butter was, you know. That's what paid my mortgage, not not playing for England. But, of course, yes, I, I would have loved to have played for England. Yeah, and uh, um, we'll come on to speaking about England very shortly because there's a, a little football tournament going on at the moment. But <laughs> yeah. be, before we finish off on, on talking about this, because there's a lot of people who, who watch who may not be from Wolverhampton and may not have realised all of your career. You did have a, a career in management as well. Uh, mm. and, and I think... That, to me, is of interest because you, uh, you managed, as a, in my research, Walsall, Cardiff and Hensford. Now, mm. over the period of time of moving into management after a long and distinguished playing career, did you see a change in the players? Did you, did you were methods of management and tactics changing then? I mean, obviously, in the recent years, they've changed dramatically. But in, in, over that time, were they changing or was there some stability? Did, was it a joined up thing from when you'd started playing? Well, we're going back, we're, we're going back a long time ago. Um, I had three, I had four years at Bristol Rovers as a, as a player coach under Bobby Gould. Yeah. And yeah. also I had two years with uh, Jerry Francis as assistant manager. Yeah. And I learned so much from Jerry Francis on a coaching uh, level uh, because he'd worked with Terry Venables and some top managers uh, at Tottenham, uh, QPR. And what he put out into our team, and we, we, as a Bristol Rovers side, we put together a side that actually won the league and got promotion before Bristol City. And we, we, didn't, have a, we didn't have a pot to win in. We, we had no money and nothing to try and buy players. We, we put a side together. But what he did was, and I learned this, that every day, every training session we had, it was always a team um, training session where we stuck together as a unit, got back together behind the ball, closed the ball down together. And we was, and we was well organised um, and it repetition stuff all the time. And we was fit as a fiddle. And, and that... That took us to win, and um, um, we beat Bristol City 3 0 at uh, Bath City's old ground. 
our Bath City's ground as it is now. And uh, we won the league. And then we took them to Autoglass Cup final, which had never been to Wembley before in the in the history of the club. So we had we had fantastic success. Jerry was now being floated around, floated around about the big clubs in QPR and Tottenham and all that. And um, I asked him when when John Barnwell, <laughs> my ex-manager at, uh, at Wolves, uh, got the sack at Walsall, I wasn't sure where I stood if Jerry moved on. He never asked me if I'd go with him. Uh, the club never asked me I'd take o- if, if I could take over uh, if he left. So I was now, my contract was ending and I was worried about where my next club was going to be. So I've always been interested in coaching and managing. And um, so Walsall job came and I asked Jerry if I could apply for the job. He said, of course you can. And I went to see Barry Blower, who was the chairman of Walsall at the time, and he gave me the opportunity to manage. And not knowing that they were moving from Fellas Park to um, to the new ground, Bescott. Yeah, and also they'd been relegated two years on the trot, so they've come from the second to the third to the fourth division. And when I got there, I was I, I was offered the job. I took it, and um, I, I had a squad of players that was on big money, a uh, second division money, and we were in the fourth division. And I had to have a big clear out. I tried to clear them out at the same time, try to get some results. And there was one eighteen-year-old who, um, when I said, "Look." You're going to have to take a, a, a cut in, in your bonuses because you're on second division bonuses. We're in the fourth division. If we have a good start, we'll be bankrupt. That's yeah. how close we were. So I said, oh, if you don't take, a, if you don't sign a new document of a bonus uh, scheme, um, I'll have to play the youth team. And mm. uh, one 18 year old, a young lad called Dean Smith, said, "Well, what would you do then, Gaffer?" I said, "I'll play the youth team thing." And um, only two players refused to sign, which I couldn't play because, and then they were the most two experienced players. But I thought I've gone right into the frying pan here. I, it was, it was, um, it was very hard work for the first two years in particular. But I stuck in. I got stuck into it, and um, I got rid of, uh, sorted a lot of players out. I didn't. I, I wanted to keep some of them because they were good players, but financially we couldn't afford to do that. And uh, so, yeah, the first two years was uh, sorting, sorting the squad out, moving to Bescott, beautiful stadium. Um, and it was hard work. Uh, it was, and I had no, I had, I had Paul Taylor, who was a general manager, but I couldn't, I couldn't bring any coaches in. I had no assistance. I had no scouting network. So it, it, I took his toll on me over the years, Jim, um, Bill, I mean, and, and, and I, I, I just found it after four years. I got me in the playoffs. We lost in the playoffs and, and I had a bust up um, with the chairman. Uh, he got me at the wrong time. My brother had just died. I'd, I'd gone back too early. He told me to have as much time off as I, as I wanted when Terry died. And um, I went back too early and he got me in a bad day and I, and I, I just said something that I shouldn't have done and, and that he said, right, you can leave the club. And that was it. So this is the insight into life in management that the fans don't see. Yeah, yeah. Well, I what you want about them? They, they they wanted their club to be run and managed by you know uh, managed properly and get success and and. Uh, but yeah, but I was um, I was doing everything. My wife would meet me on the motorway with sandwiches and coffee when I was going down south to watch players. I was going up north. I was staying in hotels. I was buying fish and chips for my dinner and. Um, none of the none of the, none of the fans knew any of this. None of the players knew. It. I just kept it quiet. But it was it, I was I was I was all over the place. It was, just, and then I and then on on training days, I had to have nearly thirty bloody players that that I had to do and keep them all occupied. You know what I mean? I couldn't split them up and do this and do that. Um, so it was, that, it was that hard work. Too much for anyone. I won't I won't bore you anymore, Bill. No, it's not boring. Kenny, it's not boring. It's it's an interesting insight. And, and all, I was, all I was going to say was it, it's too much for anyone, even, you know, even Kenny Hibbett, it's too much for, do you know what I mean? I, I, you know, listening to that, that, that's really interesting, I think, because so many of us, and I've been the same with football fans, oh, bloody hell, what's he doing? What's he playing at? We don't yeah, see yeah. any of this no. <laughs> that goes on behind the scenes. None whatsoever. So, uh, you know, thank you for that insight. It's It's fascinating. Well, it was let's, tough. well, let's move on. Let's move on. on to 
a couple of the, the modern day football. Now we've got lots of things happening with the modern day football. Before we get on to the Euros, we can have a good we can have a good chunter about the Euros in a bit. But modern day football, the Premiership. <laughs> now I think that there's been well, I don't think it's a matter of opinion. There's been a huge change in the way football's played. Probably, arguably, the players are fitter. Um, probably they they are personally quicker. And tactically, there's more nuance to the game. But when you look at it and you compare it to the game you played, has all that change been for the positive, for the good? Do you think there are, there is, there's things that have come into football that perhaps uh, should have been shelled or, we, you know, if we had a time machine, we could just get, try and get rid of? No, I think I think there's been a massive improvement. The biggest improvement we've seen is uh, is um, stadiums uh, and pitches. The pitches are grass every week. Um, the stadiums, the facilities now for supporters is far greater and better than they were when you were growing up. Yeah. Um, I've been working in the Premier League for the last seventeen years. Um, I've retired this year, but. Uh, and I've been I've been all over the places, um, and I've been watching the top clubs. And I only did Premier League unless I was watching a referee who was um, progressing from the Championship, who, who, who we could put into the elite group in the Premier League. So I have seen a lot, a lot of games over that 17-year period, and the game has changed. There's no question about that. I think it's um, I think the slow build-ups from the back now that, that we never used to see, because the goal kicks was always it long. Yeah. Uh, is it wide or you got it up to the front man with Dugan flicking on this? I'm just about Wolves, but it was general that was. Um, now it's the goal kicks don't have to come out of the penalty box. So now you've got two full backs who stand on the six yard line and they play little balls here, little balls there. If we'd have played like that in our days, it, it'd have been suicidal because we were with we the muddy pitches um, yeah. and the fans, Wolves fans in them days, that wasn't their game. Wolves were no. never a side that built from the back. Wolves were a side that got it wide in the box and scored goals and chances. And that's what they want to see. A, a lot of goal mouth uh, incidents. But you, there's less goal mouth incidents now, attacking wise, I mean, than, there is, than there's ever been. In my opinion, that is. Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and, I, and I think that pe play, uh, fans now are more patient now than they were in the 70s and 80s when I was playing football. I think it's only changed silly at Wolves since since Nuno uh, came in because I, I, you know, Wolves fans have <laughs> always been brought up on this get the ball forward and attack mentality, and I yeah. think it's one of the great testimonies to Nuno as a man, not just as a manager, but as a man that he actually got Wolves fans to get behind him and back this totally different kind of play. I mean, it, I, I used to look at it and think. Is this Wolves? This this doesn't mm. feel right. Doesn't look right. But you know the results came. But I think only recently, under under probably the one of the best managers I've ever seen at Wolverhampton, that that we've changed our our view on it. I think. Well, we we we've changed massively, um, and things do change. I mean, Christ, we're going back forty years when I was playing. Um, so you know, it's a, it's a long time ago. Um, I I. I I love the I love the I, I love the way that um, the pitches are done now. I mean, I used to inspect the pitches when I was working, and they're just the other bowling greens. I mean, to play on them now for me, uh, it would have been wonderful. We had so many great players in England. We had a lot of great players at Wolves in my time that would have loved to play now, passing around ball around. And I, uh, you, you said earlier that they were fitter. Well, I'm not sure they're fitter. I, they say the game's quicker. Well, the ball moves quicker. Yeah. The ball moves beautiful now. They water the pitch before the game, whether it's raining or not. They put the water on the pitch and they're zipping the ball. So you don't have to go meet it like we did. Or, you, yeah. you know, yeah. you don't have to hit it hard to get it to, to your, your, your mate. Um, they just go bang, 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 bang. They zip it around. It's lovely. I, I love watching it. But I'd like to see it more often in the attacking half than than their own half. And when they talk about possession, percentage of possession, most of it's in their own half. Yeah, it's meaningless, isn't it? Well, if you look at the Euros and you watch the Euros, how slow they are building up, building up, building up. They pass, 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 get it back. The, the goal today, a back pass from from Spain, went over the goalkeeper's foot straight into the net. Yeah. One goal, you know, and that was a 25, 30 yard pass back. 
that would never seem to happen in nowadays. I know that the goalkeepers in and now could pick the ball up from a back pass, but yeah, it's very very different. Um, but you know, it's the way it's, it's football's gone. I'm, I I I love watching it. I've watched all the, I've watched all these games, all the European games, and um, yeah, it's 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 hard to come. It's hard to. It's hard to say in our days was it better or is it nowadays was it is it better? It, it's um, it's football as it is and that's how it's changed. It has changed big time. And I don't like going back talking about when we played in Derby County with six inches of snow, uh, mud on your feet, you know, and uh, with an orange ball though. You know, orange the, ball, yeah. Well, that's right. That, that's, uh, a, that's a highlight for everyone. The orange yeah, ball, exactly, with the snow. exactly. And also, also, Bill, we've got we've got. Um, Lots of foreign players um, coming over now, and and all our co most of our coaches are foreigners. Um, almost of our owners are foreigners, so yeah. you know they they brought in from all over the world now. Um, players, managers, coaches, owners. It's completely different. It well, is what it is. I must say you're more forward thinking than me, Kenny, because I preferred the old way. I, I must admit, I, prefer, <laughs> I, I much prefer to see a few tackles flying in and the ball going down the wing and people <laughs> contesting headers. I mean, and, and, you know, that, that to me, that's football. And, and uh, what they do now is very pretty, but I'm, I'm not convinced. Anyway, that, that's me being a, 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 always uh, not being the most progressive <laughs> character. Um, mm. let's, uh, talking about the Euros, uh, we're yep. coming on to, to the last part, so now we, we'll get into it. First of all, I've got to ask a question uh, before we get on to it. There's been the controversy at the start of all the Euros where the England players were taking the knee, there was booing, et cetera, et cetera. Can you relate to the players? Can you can you imagine, can you give us a feeling of how they must feel in those circumstances where politics has impinged on football and views are coming across? I guess that's well, not something you had to encounter in, in your playing days. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not one, uh, I'm, I, either way of me, I'm, if they take the knee, it's great because of what's happened. Um, I'm not a politician. I, I, yeah. I um, it's a difficult one for me to answer because I mean, I, I'm, I'm with it. Um, some people are against it, but if we, if, if we've got to try and get equality and um, you know, in, get all these um, things out of the way, if this is part of it, then we do it. You know, we, yeah. we take the knee and, and move and move on. Um, it's all part and parcel of, of the future. It's something that we have to get together more. Um, and we've seen that. We've seen that. I think it's happening. You know, I think it's happening quite well. It's, it's, we're working hard at it to, to try and get all the right things done. Um, but I'm, I, I do, I'm, I'm, you know, I. I don't like to talk too much about that because you, we all have different opinions and I, exactly. I wouldn't like to upset anybody. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to upset anybody because I'm not going to say much about it. But it is a, it's a difficult question for me to answer. Uh, it is what it is and, and I'm with it. I, I'm, I mean, I've got lots and lots of uh, friends and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the teams today I don't think took the knee. Um yeah, but some, playing, some, some have and some haven't. If I was playing, uh, I would, if I was playing, Bill, I would do it. it it's not I'm not a question about that. I would. It's no problem with me at all. And of course, you know, whenever we mention equality, I, you know, whether the rights or wrongs of what happens now, I always like to mention names like Cyril Regis, um, who I, I, you know, we can all look back on the days when big Cyril Regis was playing. And, and oh, I mean, he made his name as an Albion player. He did play a little bit for Wolves, but he's one of my heroes because that guy and others of his generation really did face some atrocious treatment and they stood strong and they were proud and they yeah. and they proved their point by bursting the back of the net and oh, you know, yeah. what what a man Cyril Regis was. You know, that, I, I play with I play with Bill, I play with Cyril at Coventry for two years. Yeah. Um, Dave Bennett. Terrific guys, terrific players. Um I only saw them as a player and as a person. Yeah, um, and that was it. I, I, I never. Um, I, I, I look at them, and I look. I look at a friend. I look at a mate. I look at a, a player. A yeah. person. I don't. I don't see any. I don't look and see him in, in any different way, shape, or form. I, I just don't. I don't understand. I don't understand. Even they, even they were terrific players. They were. Absolutely. They're fantastic players, and, and they then you know the memory of, of their achievements lives on. But um, absolutely, and they should. 
But let, let's put you on the spot. The Euros. <laughs> right then. <laughs> we got, um, we're, we're coming to the meat of the matter. We're in the knockout stages. I'm going to hold off on asking you who's going to win till a bit later on. But first of all, the England team. The England team's performances and tactics <laughs> up till now. As your assessment as a manager and as, an, as, a, as a, a man who played a great many games, do you think they're doing it right? I'm, I'm a big England fan, um, like everybody else is. Um, and I, I think he was very, he's been very, very cautious, um, possibly too cautious at times. Criticism is very easy. I've been a manager and a manager always tries to pick the team that wins the game or tries not to lose a game, but you want to try and win the games. And I can understand where he's coming from. But personally, um, I, 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 see, I see good players sitting on the bench, Sancho. Uh, Saka did really well when he came on, particularly Grealish. I, I, these are players that I like to see in my team that can run at players, push the, 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 the opposition back, and, they'll, and then it enables all the rest of his teammates to push on behind him and push right up on top of the teams. Where at the moment, he, he, on the first game he played, he played six defenders, and we were very fortunate actually. Sterling came in and got the goal that, that won us the game 1 0. And also, in, in the, the second game we won. Um, Scotland, I think we were very, very cautious again, but they looked better than us. They, they, they were up for it a bit more than us. I want to see more flair. I want to see, I want to see players on the pitch that can run at people, go past people, and be creative and get these crosses into the box for for Kane. I feel really sorry for for Kane. Um, he's a he's a natural striker. He's a great finisher. He's got great feet, but all his work is being done outside the box. Yeah. And then yeah. when he does get an opportunity, it's probably 70, 80 minutes. And he's like just throwing his leg at it or hoping that, that he's going to get on the end of, of, of anything that comes his way. But for, um, I, is, for me, we need to be more positive. And I'm not, I'm not going to criticise the manager that much, but I want to see we're England. We're big, we're strong, we're strong enough to win this tournament. But we have to be positive without being silly. Yeah. But I don't want I don't I don't want to see but I don't want to see us play negative a negative team against Germany. We have to be a positive team that's going to go at them and show them that we are the best side. So Calvin Phillips and Declan Rice, although they're both excellent players, I think Calvin Phillips has, has probably been the England player who's, who's surprised me the most with with how well he's played. No room for both of them in your side. No, I'd play one of them and I'd play Mount on one side of him and probably Foden maybe the other side or Grealish. Uh, we have to Osaka. You know, I, I want to see I want to see these youngsters, Sancho, given an opportunity and show us what you've got. These players are £100 million pound players they're talking about. So yeah, why are they yeah. sitting on the bench? Well, that, that's what surprises me. Or in um, Sancho's but, case, not even making the bench on a couple oh, of exactly, games. Exactly, exactly. You know, and I don't, I don't, unless there's, uh, there's something that we don't know, there could be something that we don't know. It might have an injury that we don't want to talk about. And I don't know. But I want to see him, I want to see him pick a positive team that can go out and win uh, the game over 90 minutes. So we pick a positive side. We pick the, the, the lineup that you put forward there for the game against Germany. Yeah. We win within 90 minutes. We've got every chance of winning within 90 minutes. You've, from what you've seen of the Germans, they're beatable. Well, they're, they're they're beatable when you go at them. If you sit back, they they like any play any team. If you sit back and let them have the ball, they they can they can rip you apart. We have to yeah. be right on top of them. You know, we have to get players, as I say, push them back. We have to have players that can good on the ball, can hold the ball up like Grealish can. He'll get free kicks. He'll create. Saka he can run at run at people like he did in the last game. Um, Sancho, let's get him out there and let just get at these defenses because. You know, defending is not the greatest at the moment in uh, in world football. I don't think that we have got great defenders anywhere, but we have got some great forward players, particularly England. And I think we can be positive by picking uh, three or four of them players I mentioned and put them in the team. We have to give them an opportunity. It's no good, you know, playing um, negative again and, and getting beat and then wishing you did. Why didn't you play these? Why did Get them in there. I, I mean, that, 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 that's my philosophy. Push Germany back. Get your forwards out there who can run at people, get past people and create. 
and give Kane an opportunity because when he gets a top, an opportunity, he'll put it in that. There's no question about that. So we've got past the Germans. Yep. Who are we worried about? Who do we think is going to give us the hardest game on our way to, to lifting this trophy? Well, I would have, I would have said um, there's two teams. I, I picked Belgium. Mm -hmm. Or well, outside, they just lost two. They just lost two key players. Yeah, they've lost the. I think Azad pulled his hamstring, and yeah. uh, De Bruyne has got a bad ankle. So I think they're two main, main two main players for for Belgium. So yeah, uh, I fancied them or, or Italy. I, I like the way Italy attack you when they when they get the ball. Um, I still think we're the strongest side in there. I still think if we don't win it, I'll be very, very disappointed. I, I look at the rest of the teams and, and I think we're strong all around. It, it just depends what he picks, who he picks. I'm not going to knock Gareth Southgate because he's built a great squad of players up, give us all hope again. He's given us a little bit of hope. But we have, the, we have got the players that can win this tournament if he plays them. Well, that that is a, a wonderfully positive note, and you've made me feel more positive because I, I must admit I, I I had had my doubts after the Scotland game um, when I, when I thought we were really really lackadaisical. Yeah. But that uh, that that spirit that you show there that that does remind me of watching you play. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that that's great. Just as we're coming towards the end, um, I mean, there were so many things. I've got a list as long as you're on to ask you, but you know, I'm aware of not keeping you all not because I know you've. You know, that wouldn't be fair. But so many things I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to say mainly, though, I hope that lockdown and the last 18 months hasn't been too difficult for you because I think a lot, a lot of people have struggled during that time. So I hope that's been not too bad for you. And we, there are uh, a lot of issues in the country with mental health and, and people struggling. And, and it's good to hear your kind of positive message is the kind of, you know, and your positive outlook and attitude is the kind of outlook that I think we're all going to need to take going yeah. forward from this point. So, I mean, I, I, has it been as positive as you seem? Have you, have you got through it as well as can be expected? Um, yeah, we've all we've all had a, a difficult time, but I, I'm quite fortunate uh, that I live in a small village where um, we can go for nice walks without interfering with other people. Um, I've done I've done three one thousand pieces of jigsaws. That I, I I got one in the January for my birthday, and I got one for Christmas, uh, and that's bit that's you know el helped uh, uh, quite a, a lot really being able to just sit down for a couple of hours at a time and um, and then go in the garden and sit in the garden and watch the wildlife around. So that's that's been that's yeah we've been all, and my daughter lives in the same village, so we was able to not get contact, but we was from the other side of the wall. They could go in the garden and we could say hello and stuff like that. My my granddaughter's had two birthdays in lockdown now in March and March. And so yeah, it's it's been difficult, but I know there's a lot more people that it more difficult than me uh, and my family. Um but we've we've come through it. Um I've had the inject both injections. I wasn't very well after the first one. I was uh, I thought I was I had I had a terrible time after the first jab, but uh, I've overcome it. Um my family's all okay, fortunately, touch wood. Um, so yeah, it has been a difficult time for everybody, and and the sooner we get back to normality, whether it is going to be normality again, I don't know, but we have to still abide by the rules, and um, and we just take what the government tells us and what the scientists tell us. Uh, everybody's got different opinions, but I, I I just stick by the rules, and and I don't break them in any way, shape, or form, and none of my family do. I make sure of that. Well, I, c I can well imagine that if you lay down the law, Kenny, that they're probably <laughs> listen to it. Um, right. Well, we're, we're coming to to the end, so um, it's it's been a real treat speaking to you. And uh, the reason I've mentioned about those because there there is a some charitable work that uh, I'm going to mm -hmm. I'm engaging in personally with an organisation called Support Futures about helping people out the other side of yeah, this so pandemic, right. and uh, that's. That's something that uh, I may mention to you in future. Uh, yeah. But we've not we've not had full chance to go to everything I wanted. But it's been a brilliant fifty nine minutes or so so far. I've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it, Kenny. And I, I want to say, really genuinely, thank you for coming on the show. It has made my day, week, yeah. month, yeah. year, you name it. It's it's an absolute treat. And, it's been um, an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you so much, and. Brilliant to have you on board. And for everyone out there, if you've enjoyed 
listening to what Kenny's had to say. If you've enjoyed the show, as I say, there's all the time to everyone. Share it round. Tell people. Click the follow on YouTube and share it around social media. Let's get the message out and let's get people hearing stories like Kenny's, so positive, so upbeat, and still got that attitude and drive that he showed so well on the football pitch for all those years. And he's cleared up a few things about uh, about the uh, his history today, particularly the Hillsborough incident. So we'll 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 not ask that one again, right? <laughs> From all of us, it's a good night. Cheers.